But if you cast your cares on Jesus, I know he cares for you. Is there anything too hard for him? Living here has caused me pain. Things I just don't understand. You ever felt that way? I must, I must recount your faithfulness and the mercy from your hand. Because when everything is said and done, and there's nothing left to say, the cross of Christ is
has kept you. The reason I'm smiling is I know who I'm talking to tonight. Some people in this place feel like everything you've tried to do is just not quite worked out. Some people here whose lives aren't right with Jesus. You're wondering what you're even doing here. <laughs> but you see, I know why you're here. Because there's a lover of your soul. There's a keeper of your heart. And he knows every pain and he knows every hurt. He knows every failure. And you're not here tonight by accident. Even the mess-ups in your life, he knows about it. He's got them planned out. Because he's the keeper of your heart and the lover of your soul. When there are things I just don't understand, things don't go the way I planned for them to go. I just have to remember your faithfulness, Lord, and the mercy of the Lord and the mercy <laughs> this is different tonight but he's doing something now the mercy of the Lord somebody needs to hear that the Lord has mercy no matter how far you've gone, no matter how deep in sin you are, the mercy of the Lord is everlasting. And he's calling to you tonight. And you ask yourself, did I come to the right place? Why am I here? And the Lord says, because I planned you to be here. I ordained you to be here tonight. Because I want to pour out my mercy upon you. I want to pour out my mercy upon you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Woo! Your mercy, Lord, has pierced my heart, and it brings me to my knees. In reverent fear, I'll trust your ways, and I'll worship at your feet. Because when everything is said and done, and there's nothing left to say,
Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Go ahead. Sing to the Lord of the world. Sing to the God of the universe.
glory covers the face of the earth.
Get that show far ready. Let me get that show far out just a second. 
This is the strangest one we've done yet, I think. If you're a revival tonight for the first time, you go, well, I figured that revival out. They do that every night. And not exactly. The Spirit of the Lord, I don't know how to explain this to you, but as I'm leading these songs, I can't help but just feel my spirit bursting forth because it's like I can almost sense who's here. It's like I, a lot of folks here, a lot of questions in your mind. You've heard about this revival. You've read the papers, maybe the good, maybe the bad. And you're going, could that be? Could that be? And I believe the Spirit of the Lord is stirring your heart tonight to make you realize just how many landmarks you've left and just how many things that you've walked away from when you used to believe your denomination, the affiliation you're with, used to believe in the power of God. But because there's so much sin, it doesn't happen anymore. And God is just saying to us tonight, I can still do everything. Oh. <laughs> Brother Steve, he didn't run out. You want to hand that over to him? He didn't run out of power with the book of Acts closing. The power of God is just as powerful today as it ever has been. He's been looking for people to hear. Dick, blow that so far. Yes, Lord. Yeah, that thing blows, don't it, man, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. You know, the church has become so ignorant in the sound of the shofar. 
You know, even, even when a young man would go to claim his bride, you know that the bridegroom's attendants carried a shofar and they shouted, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and they blew the shofar. Folks, we're about ready to enter that stage. I believe that with all my heart. Amen. The shofar was used to bring up the glory of God. The shofar was used whenever they wanted to declare war. Last night we had, believe it or not, now if you weren't here, you wouldn't believe it, but Pastor Kerry's going to attest to what I'm saying. The whole bottom floor was totally full and half of the balcony was full of people crying out for souls this week. Crying out for souls this week. Something is, something is happening in the spiritual realm. Now, last week, I, it was incredible. The altar calls and the people that came to the Lord last week, it was just awesome and incredible. But, folks, I believe this week's going to be a better week than it's ever been in a whole revival. Can you say amen? One of the things in prayer time, and I, one of the things that Mike Brown, when he first came here, he taught a class on one of the greatest sins in a believer's life is lack of prayer. Sometimes we can take five minutes that we're watching television and turn off the television and in five minutes touch the hem of the garment of Jesus for souls, friends. And while I was in prayer time some two or three months ago, I saw a beautiful bride without a face. And she was getting ready to come down the aisle, but she was in the foyer. And they were straightening everything, the little, the little curls they were straightening, the flowers they were straightening. And they were, they were smoothing her dress just before she came down the aisle. And friends, I'm going to tell you what, that's what's happening in so many lives in this revival. The little tiny wrinkles are being pressed out of the garment. Jesus is getting ready to come for his bride. Can you say amen? Act like a bride. You're cheerful. We're happy. We're the bride. We're the bride. We're the bride. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God bless you as you're seated. We're going, to, we're going to do something very spiritual. We're going to take up an offering. <laughs> yes, come on. Now that same enthusiasm ought to be here. We don't say much a, lot, a, a whole lot about offerings around here. We do offer the invitation for you to give. And uh, we're getting ready to pee, put up a tent. Isn't that right, Pastor? Going to get experience something that you've been praying for. I want to just help you to receive everything that you possibly can receive from God this week. I had the image before during worship. I, I thought of one of those old shows. I don't know if they still have these kind of things, but someone goes on a spending spree. They have a certain amount of time to go through stores and to spend this money. And they, they go flying down the aisles and they're grabbing everything they can, trying to take in everything because when the time's up, it's up. And I want to encourage those of you who are here this week to really get in everything you possibly can to maximize the time that you have here. Uh, I had some dear friends visiting from New England last week, and they were just sitting in the meetings and taking in the ministry of the Word and the Spirit. And by Saturday morning, I have a day session on Saturday mornings that open to everyone. And by Saturday morning, they were too wiped out to make it to the day session, just sitting and receiving. They were exhausted already. And, and that often happens. People come here, just receive, and they're exhausted by the schedule. Dive in, get absolutely everything you can get. Tomorrow morning at 11, across the street in the chapel, there'll be a video presentation from Lila Terhoon, who heads up our intercession here. Uh, these presentations have been effective in person or on video, and I encourage you to get there. If you're hungry for prayer, understand more about prayer and intercession, you should do that. Also, and we'll tell you about our Friday sessions tomorrow night, our, our session for leaders that I'll be teaching and other sessions that we have uh, for leadership on Fridays. But I have an announcement from Richard Crisco, who's our youth pastor, who's over in the chapel. Uh, I understand that there are many young people that are here because of spring break. And if you're from junior high age up to college age, you have Richard's personal invitation to join the youth meeting at seven o'clock across the street in the chapel. One of the greatest things about this revival is what God is doing among the young people. So this is the first time Richard's ever asked me to specifically tell the young people, pack the chapel out tomorrow night and God will meet you. But I want to say something else, though, that, that could help you receive what God has for you. One of the problems that people have 
when they come into an environment where God is moving is that it's different. I'm not used to it. And we'll often have people checking things out for two or three or four days, and when they finally conclude it's really God, they have to get on the plane and fly home. You have to understand that revival by its very definition means something different. When we're praying for revival, we're not praying for more of the same. The same has been the problem. The same rut, the same coldness, the same lukewarmness, the same compromise, the same prayerlessness, the same flesh, the same dead religion. We don't need more of the same. So when we're praying God send revival, we're asking him for change, and change often comes differently than we expect. The reason that God often comes in the back door is because the front door is closed. And I was saved in a little Italian Pentecostal church in New York. I went there as a heroin shooting Jewish rock drummer to pull my two best friends out at the age of 16, and, and God saved me. Logical place, an Italian Pentecostal church with about 50 people in it. And, and somehow we thought that we had no traditions, that we went straight back to the Bible. And we didn't know that we also had our own little box that we had God in. And the pastor used to tell the story about a bum who was sitting out on a park bench across from a church on Christmas Eve. And he's sitting there in the snow. And suddenly Jesus appears to him. And this man is, the, the street person is sitting there crying. And Jesus appears to him and sits next to him and says, Son, what's the matter? And the bum says, Jesus, it was Christmas Eve, and I wanted to get into church, and I went to the door to go to church for the special Christmas Eve service, but they didn't like the way I was dressed, and they wouldn't let me in. And Jesus says to him, hey, don't cry. I've been trying to get into that church for 20 years. They won't let me in either. See, we used to tell that story in our church. We didn't realize it applied to us also. There was a Welsh leader who I heard speak in England last year, and he said that he talked to some old sisters. When he was a younger man, he talked to some old sisters who had been praying for revival in Wales before the Welsh revival began in 1904, and then they heard the reports that God was moving. They heard the reports that something was happening, and they crept into the back of a church meeting. The place was packed out. People were jumping and shouting and saying, hallelujah, hallelujah. Others were praying. Others were crying. And they saw it. It was so different than what they were used to. They got offended, and they said, this is not God. And they walked out, and they confessed to him with tears, we missed the great Welsh revival. We prayed for it, and when it came, we missed it. So I want to encourage you tonight to major on the majors. The whole theme of this worship tonight has been to know God, to trust Him, to be filled by His presence, to experience His revival power. Seek His face earnestly. And when He speaks to you, respond. Open your heart. I have an account here. I'm just going to share this with you, and then we'll give you a break. There was a pastor on Long Island that I spent some time with years ago. We had lunch one time. And the one thing I remember, we just spent a few hours together, the one thing I remember was his skepticism. He's like many of us, we've heard all the talk, we've heard all the big claims, we've heard the boasts, we haven't seen the reality, we get a little skeptical. We hear God's moving and we say, yeah, we heard about that before. That's the one thing I remember, his skepticism. Well, a few weeks ago, he showed up here in a service and I barely remembered him. Then, yes, I remember, that's him. And he, he wrote a report for a Christian newspaper on Long Island. And, and listen to what he says. He talks about the prayer meeting Tuesday night. And, and he says, the next night, first night of that week's revival, saw hundreds running to the altar to repent. There was fervent weeping and wailing as multitudes cried out to God to forgive their sins. That's revival. He said he's been waiting for revival. At the altar, a man next to me, notice he says, at the altar, a man next to me, which means that this pastor was also at the altar. You'll understand why in a little while. If your heart's open, God will speak to you. At the altar, a man next to me, yes, I too came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. A man next to me was screaming at the top of his voice, please, God, save me. 
I'm a fornicator. I'm an adulterer. I'm unfaithful to my wife. He was so loud in my ear that I had trouble concentrating on my own need for repentance. All this took place when we were down on our faces before God. I have never heard such sobbing and wailing of, as scores of convicted souls cried out to a merciful God. I, for one, and I'm sure many, have found mercy through the blood of Jesus there at the altar. And God touched him. He said to me one night, Mike, remember my skepticism. And the power of God hit him. The power of God hit his wife. And he wants to spread revival fire wherever he goes. So friends, open your hearts wide to God. Look to him. Worship him. Feast on his word. As Jesus is exalted, worship the living God. And whatever God deals with you about, friend, just put your life afresh in his hands. Hold nothing back from him. He'll hold nothing back from you. And you can be encouraged to know something. You know, there, there aren't different layers here at Brownsville. And I, I say this just by way of introduction because there are always so many visitors on Wednesday night. They're not different layers here where when you get back into the inner sanctum, you find out the real secrets. We are exactly who we say we are. Two of the gentlemen that were ushers here tonight, two brothers right in the middle. One of them has been in this church, I think, 43 years, and the other's been in this church 48 years. This was a church just like many churches that you folks go to, hungry, thirsty for God, and God visited. Regular people who love Jesus, God visited. And that's all God has to work with. Regular people who love Jesus. There are no secrets, hidden tricks, mirrors. It's an encounter with God that we're after. So friends, I want to encourage you, the Lord will meet you powerfully this week. And according to the degree of your hunger for Him, He will satisfy your longing. Would you stand to your feet together with me? We're taking a short break the, the facilities are packed here in some of the overflow rooms, the chapel. Don't go wandering around too far. When five minutes goes by, look at your watch, make sure you're back in here, all right? The Lord's going to then speak through His Word, so we'll take a short break. We welcome you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Come back quickly, and the Lord will continue to move in our midst. Well, you've been standing in line, some of you, all day. In fact, all of you in here have been standing in line longer than anybody else. That's why you're in here and they're someplace else. But we welcome those of you in the chapel, those of you in the cafeteria, and uh, in the choir room, and in the prayer room, and in hallways, and wherever you're stuffed in. We have a full capacity tonight and over, and uh, we're glad you're here. I just want to say a word to those of you that are in the overflows. God's presence is going to be there and is there, and you, I'm sure you've already sensed that. And God is going to bless you tremendously before this service is over. The greatest part of the service is yet to come. May I have your attention, please? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. The greatest part of the service is yet to come. And uh, uh, in just a few moments, our evangelist is going to preach, and uh, he's going to give an altar call, and all of these chairs are going to be gone, and there are going to be people coming to this altar. You're going to see great things happen, and uh, you're going to see people's lives change, and it'll be the same in the other uh, overflow areas. And uh, God is just going to bless us tremendously before this service is open, uh, over. So keep your heart open to what God is going to do. Now, we, we've got people here from all over the world. We have people here from all kind of religious denominations. One of the great things about this revival is that the walls of partition that have separated us uh, religiously, those walls are coming down. And that's what religion does. Religion separates folks, but thank God those walls are coming down, and we're forgetting about religion, and we're concentrating on Christianity. Christianity makes us one in Christ. And uh, so we know you stood in line all day, and some folks say, well, you know, it's, uh, it's tough to stand in line, and it is. But hey, we stand in line for all kinds of things, to get in athletic events, uh, music events, entertainment events. Uh, we go to Disney World and uh, our Six Flags over Georgia or Texas or wherever, and we stand in line, and we get on a ride, and two minutes later, we get a little tickle in our tummy, and that's the end of it. Right now, when you stand in line, what you receive is for eternity. It's not a two-minute thrill. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we praise God you're here. Uh, how many of you are from uh, the southeast United States? 
okay? You're in the southeast United States, all right? How, how many of you are, for, are from the northern part of the United States, the northeast, up in that area, okay? Great. How about the Midwest? How many of you are from up in the Midwest? Oh, yeah. You know, one of Dr. Cho's uh, part of the prophecy was that uh, the revival is going to spread west and up the Mississippi Valley and uh, right up into the heartland of the USA. And uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing people come down from that area up there. So God's, God's beginning to show up up there. Praise God. How many of you are from the southwest? All right. Let me guess. Y'all are from Texas, right? Ah. <laughs> okay. Praise God. Praise God. Well, God bless Texas. <laughs> Amen. How many of you are from the far west, California and the northwest? Yes, praise God. All right. Well, let me ask you this. How many of you are from outside of the continental United States? Would you, would you stand up, those of you from the con outside the continental United States, just stand up for a moment. Praise God. Up in the balcony. Amen. Those, uh, remain standing, if you will, please. Those of you from outside the United States, you're in overflows. Uh, there, are, there are some, there are staff people in those overflows, so you, they're going to identify you to uh, the people that are there. But let's find out where folks are from. Where are you folks from? Australia. Praise God. I'll tell you what, if you'll hold your applause until, until we get through everybody, then we'll give everyone an applause. Where are you folks from? Canada. Praise God. How about you, sis? Australia. Okay, how about back there? Barbados, Japan, Korea. Okay. Where? Malaysia, great. Norway, praise God. Thank you. Where are you folks right in here from? Canada, praise God. We're glad you're here. Where are you from, brother? Where? Japan, Australia, great. Where are you ladies from right there? Germany, praise God. We're glad to have you. How about right up in the balcony up there? There are four people. Where are you from? Norway, praise God, we're glad to have you. Praise God. Where are you folks right here from? Australia. Australia? England, praise God. All right, how about these folks right back here? Norway. Norway. Man, we've got a lot of people. Do you folks know one another from Norway? Hello. All right, there are four people up there, and there are some folks right down here from Norway. Y'all need to get together. You had to come all the way to the United States to meet one another. You had brothers and sisters that you didn't even know about. Part of the family's here. All right? Where are you folks from right there? Canada? God bless you. The three ladies right there. England. Praise God. The couple. Where? England? Great. South Africa. Praise God. Where are you from, brother? South Africa. God bless you. Amen. Finland, all right. Praise God. Let's get it right. Okay. Where, where are you from right here? Japan. God bless you. We're getting a lot of people from Japan, and we're thrilled about that. God's going to come there into that country. Right here, brother. I know. India. Yes, yeah, so good to see you. God bless you. Right behind him. England. God bless you, sir. Australia. Ireland, <laughs> sir, Scotland, praise God, Germany, praise God, where is, uh, where is that group right there, where, where are you from, all right, God bless you, how about this couple right here, Thailand, yes, praise God, praise God, we're so happy to have you here. We want you to be blessed. We're praying for your countries. When we first started in this revival, it was sort of a local thing, and then it became a regional thing. Is there someone else up there? Indonesia. Indonesia. God bless you. Then it became a regional thing. Then it became a, 
uh, a thing uh, with the United States, and now we're seeing people come from all over the world, and we welcome you here. Wherever you're from, God loves you and has a plan for your life, and God is going to bless you tremendously. Stand with us now as Lyndall leads us in worship again. upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news oh the spirit of the sovereign lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news to the poor
before you're seated, I'd like for everyone to uh, remain standing just for a minute, everyone in the chapel, the cafeteria, the choir room, we are at over capacity tonight, which has happened many, 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 many times here at this revival. And um, it really doesn't matter how many people come, God meets everybody. And so it doesn't make any difference if you're in the choir room. I remember one night I walked in and, and there was this girl, there's been times that we have to project the revival meetings on the wall in the hallways and because there's no room in any of the buildings. And so people sit on the floor in the hallways and watch the revival on the wall. And there's a speaker in the ceiling. And, and this one particular girl, she didn't even have a place in front of a in front of a, a screen on the wall. She couldn't watch the revival. She was just sitting underneath the speaker. And I walked by there and I said, how you doing? She goes, great. And I said, um, I said, you enjoying the revival? She goes, yeah, first time here. And she was sitting in a seat underneath the speaker in the hallway, just having the time of her life, man. And uh, she, uh, she just really didn't care where she was on this campus as long as she was here. And um, I just want to let you know, friend, that your attitude has a lot to do with that. If you're in the choir room or the chapel, you know, and you weren't able to wait in line and you're in another room and you're going, man, I really want to be in that main auditorium. Friend, let me tell you, this is experience speaking to you. We've been here since Father's Day of 95. We've had the most miraculous things take place outside of this building right here. We've seen it take place in the chapel, the choir room. Miracles take place everywhere because God is not limited to a facility. It all has to do, it all has to do with your hunger. If you're hungry for God, he'll meet you. Everyone is here under divine appointment. That means um, God brought you here. If you're here with a group on spring break and they drug you down here, you don't want to be down here. You'd rather be somewhere else and you're down here. Maybe somebody tricked you. And maybe your family said, let's all go to Florida for spring break. And you go, yeah, the beach is Disney World. Oh! And then you stop in Pensacola and you're looking around, you're in church, and you're mad as a hornet at your parents for bringing you here. Friend, lighten up. You are where God wants you. This is a divine appointment. You're supposed to be here. Everyone is supposed to be here. Those of you from Japan, this is a divine appointment. From Norway, this is a divine appointment. This is when you are supposed to be here. God is also going to speak to you tonight. He knows how to prepare the heart for the message and the message for the heart. I want you to be ready to receive from the Lord. In just a few minutes, Charity is going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. And many of you are going to get right with God, those of you that are away from the Lord. I want everyone us to pray right now. Everyone in all the facilities, before you sit down, I want to pray with me right now. We're going to pray that Jesus Christ would speak to our lives, speak to our hearts, and change our lives. Everyone pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. Now, there's some people that did not pray that. I want everyone to look this way in the other rooms also. There's people that did not pray that, and the reason you did not pray that is because you're rebellious. That's what you are. You're rebellious. And you're not only, now I want you to listen. There's a father in this room that did not pray that prayer just then. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life. You did not pray that. You didn't want to pray that prayer because you're stubborn and rebellious. But you're dealing with children in your own household that are just like you. You want them to be you want them to yield to you and be obedient to you, but you won't even pray a simple prayer. See, they're becoming just like you. And the Lord's speaking to you right now, sir. He's telling you, it's time for you to change. It's time for you to yield and say, Lord, speak to my heart. Change me. I'm a stubborn man. I'm a rebellious man. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite hypocritical to, to want your kids to change if you won't change. We've had so many stories of young lives being changed and, you know, parents that were religious, they've been in the church all their lives and their kids come to this revival, their teens come to the revival and get radically changed, radically changed. And the kids come home and they see hypocrisy in the home. They, they come home and they'll come home from a revival meeting and dad will be at home watching some R-rated movie on HBO. And the kids will go, daddy, you know, you can't do that and teach Sunday school, too. 
You can't do that. And we'll have parents at times go, who do you think you are? This is my house. I can do what I want. And who are you to speak to me? That's rebellion, sir. That's rebellion. You need to let the Lord speak to your child, speak through your child. I had one mother come up to me and thank God for this revival. She said, she said, my daughter has so changed. We would watch soap operas together. We would do things together what we weren't supposed to do. And she got saved in your revival. Came back home and cleaned house. And I was watching television. One of the programs we always watch together, she said. My daughter came in. She goes, Mama, we need to talk about that. <laughs> daughter turned off the television, sat her mama down, and said, Honey, this thing's got to go. It's holiness, friend. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me speak just for a minute to those of you that are backslidden in this room. I'm going to cover this at the beginning of the message. Listen in the chapel, choir room, cafeteria. I want everyone to listen. We're dealing with a nation right now that is in extreme danger. A lot of people think they're saved and they're not. A lot of people say they love the Lord, but they don't. Let me ask you a question. If somehow, supernaturally, right now it would be supernatural, but in the future it's going to be possible with the technology, if somehow we could fit everyone in all these buildings, several thousand people in an airplane, just a jumbo, jumbo jet, a Boeing jet, and just take to the sky and head towards California, we're all on the plane together, and we're cruising at 40,000 feet, and the right engine cuts out, and everyone feels it. You can feel the plane just back up a little bit and it cuts out and then, then the left one cuts out. And the plane begins to wobble a little bit in midair and then you just feel it start to drop and then it turns its nose down and starts just hurtling towards earth and it's screaming towards judgment. And of course, everyone in the plane is freaked totally because we all know we're gonna die, everyone knows. In a situation like that, if that should happen tonight, would you repent? Or would you worship? If you were in a situation like that tonight, would you go, dear God, these, the pornography, the lust in my heart, Lord, get rid of it. Or would you go, Jesus, into thy hands I commit my spirit. What would you do, friend? Now, a lot of us in this room would say, into thy hands, Lord, because we're clean. We're clean before the line. That's not a holier-than-thou statement, friend. It's just that you can get clean in Jesus. You can live clean. How many believe that? You can live holy. But others in this room would say, no, I'd have to repent. I want to tell you why you're saying you'd have to repent, because you're backslid or you've never known the Lord. Some of the symptoms of a backslider are you have lost your spiritual appetite. A backslider has lost his spiritual appetite. Do you remember, backslider, maybe a young person in this room, maybe it was back at, during a youth camp you got on fire for God and you were just blazing a trail all summer long and, and all you did was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Everything was God and then schools rolled around. And you got into school and you met some of your unconverted friends and you started growing a little cold and boy, during the summer you were toting your Bible. You're bringing it everywhere. You go to the mall witnessing. You're talking to everybody about Jesus. And now school started, and you put away your big Bible, you bring a little New Testament, and you tuck it away in your purse. Or you hide it in your locker. And uh, you remember, backslider, a time in your life where you were so excited about the things of God. Your appetite was unquenchable. Pastors, you know what I'm talking about. You get young people or uh, folks get saved in your church on a Sunday, and next, the next Monday they're at the doorstep. What, they want more. They want to talk to you about Jesus. They just, you just stick any book in front of them. They'll just sit in the, in the foyer, just read the whole book, you know, just, they're hungry. How many have met people like that? Well, a backslider can remember back when he was on fire like that. But now you've lost your spiritual appetite. You've grown cold. These are signs of a backslidden condition. Another sure sign of a backslidden condition is this. You've grown worldly in your actions and desires. Do you remember a time when all you desired was God's will? You were consumed with Jesus and his plan for your life. That's all you wanted, but now you're backslidden. You've grown cold, and so you're more worldly in your actions and desires. I can tell a person when he's backslid in five minutes. And it's not judgmental, friend. You can tell what comes out of his mouth, what he thinks about, what he's talking about. That's who he is. 
And so, friend, if that's you and, and you'd rather talk about Florida State football than Jesus, you'd rather talk about golf scores, you'd rather talk about shopping, you'd rather talk about family than Jesus, you're backslid, friend. You're backslid. As soon as somebody brings up Jesus, you're uncomfortable. Why? You're not right with God. You've grown worldly in your actions and desires. Now, some of you aren't even looking at me anymore. You liked me a few minutes ago, but now you don't like me no more. I don't understand that. I still like you. Another sure sign of a backslidden person is this. You have become less troubled about sin. Do you remember back when the little things used to bother you? You fell under conviction easily and repented. Now those little foxes have slipped in and are destroying the vineyard, destroying your life. But they don't bother you anymore. Do you remember a time backslider when you'd sit in front of a TV set and if something came on that had curse words in it or a woman walked across the screen and became, began taking her clothes off, you'd be shocked. You'd turn the television off and you'd say, abomination. I can't believe they're showing that on television. And you'd feel grieved in your spirit and you'd walk around the room saying, wash me, Jesus. Cleanse me from all that filth. But now you're backslidden. It doesn't bother you anymore. As a matter of fact, you can sit right through that scene, the same scene that one time you'd get up grieved over. You can sit there and listen to four-letter curse words infiltrate your, home, your mind and not only yours, but everyone in the household. Your little kids that are playing in the, in the playroom in the back are listening to those four-letter words, sir. Ma'am, they're listening. They hear that. They're reverberating off the walls into the room. Don't be surprised when little Junior comes up and starts cussing. But you're backslidden, friend. Jesus would never do stuff like that. He would never sit down and watch that, and you know he wouldn't. Sure sign of a backslider. Let me give you a simple illustration. You're in Walmart, and you're checking out. And you look over at the magazines, and there's Cosmopolitan, some of the other uh, magazines, just your Glamour Girl magazines, and you, you look at them, they're always seductive. They're always, always lewd, and you, you look over and you see a girl, a woman half-dressed on the magazine. Do you turn your head, or do you stare at her, sir? If you stare at her, you're backslid. Because a person on fire for Jesus would immediately turn his head. Why? Because that grieves the Holy Ghost. And it causes fantasies to develop, develop inside of you, friend, and you wonder why you don't have the victory. See, I want to tell you why, friend. This is spiritual warfare. And you're out there praying and trying to bombard heaven, and the devil's looking at you and you go, you just a few minutes ago lusted your eyes out over this one woman, and now you're praying for your son. Ha, 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 double-minded man. You're unstable in all your ways. Friend, listen, this is serious. America's waking up. We're realizing why we're not where we, why, why we're not changing the nation. We want a nation to be like the church, dear God. No, church needs to change. Church needs to be on fire. I'm, t I'm speaking to the backsliders. Now, there are many of you in this room that don't know the Lord. You're away from God completely. You've never known God. And uh, in just a few minutes, I'm going to give you the opportunity to get saved, to give your heart to Jesus. It's simple. You trust in Him. You come to the cross. Jesus bled and died 2,000 years ago for you, friend. Most Americans have heard it 5,000 different ways. They've heard it through cantatas. They've read about it on tracks. They've read it. There's, we've got Christian comic books. I mean, you name it. We've even got major Hollywood productions that talk about Jesus to make money. You heard it, friend. Heard the gospel story. But you hear tonight, maybe you're a Muslim or a Jew or... Maybe you're from a cult, or maybe you're a group of witches visiting from New Orleans. We know that you come all the time, and you're here to check this thing out. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is the one who spoke this whole thing into existence. And some of you are stargazers. You worship the stars. The one who is in this room and on this campus, he's the one who flung the stars out there. Why worship the stars? Why not worship the creator of the stars? And those of you, I was watching the Discovery Channel the other day, and yes, my family does have a TV set. 
And yes, we do control it. We control it. And we were watching Discovery Channel, and this man was talking about a bug that he studied all his life. And that's all he, he gave his whole life. The guy's in his 70s now. He spent his whole life studying this bug. And um, he knew all about the bug, man. <laughs> he knew more than I ever know about that bug. He knew about the bug. He knew all the different species of the bugs. But, but I grieved in my spirit as I watched him talk about that bug. You know, and I can see him on that final day. But Lord, I dissected it. I knew all the species. I knew all the colors everywhere it lived on the globe. Jesus. And some of you are like that. You spend your life educating your brain and you lose your soul. You learn the butterfly and the intricate details of the butterfly, but you never meet the one who made the butterfly. Or maybe you're a tarot card reader. You're into the, the, the psychic arts or into 1900 psychic channels, and, and, and maybe you'll go and sit down. I remember, you know, in New Orleans, they'll have, in the outside, they have all these plazas. They do all over the world, but they have these little plazas, and all these gurus sit out there with all the cards. And, and I look at that and I go, my God made the trees where they got the paper to make the cards. You know, I mean, you're into the wrong thing, friend. Tonight you can meet Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one, the only one, whose name there is no other name under heaven whereby a man can be saved. It's the name of Jesus, and he's in this room. He's in this room. You can meet the Lord, and you can leave out of here with the Lord. It's a mystery. Well, tonight I'm going to be speaking the second part of a message I started last week, and I rarely do this, but God will not let me go on this. This is the God seekers. The God seekers. There's something happening right now, friend, in America, really all over the world. People are hungry for truth. Amos said it in the words. You read the book of Amos. He was a minor prophet. But you'll read where he said this, that there's coming a famine in the land, not a famine for food or for water, but for truth. And people are going to wander to and fro throughout the whole earth. They're going to be groping, looking. They're not going to be able to find it, friend. They're going to be starving for the truth. And I've preached on famine in the land before, friend. People are hungry for the truth. They're sick and tired of religion. Religion's hanging around the cross. Christianity's getting on the cross. People are sick and tired of religion. A Baptist pastor called me the other day from up north, and he said that very thing. He said, I am so tired. He said, I've got a large church. I'm so sick and tired of day in, day out church. He said, Steve, can I be honest with you? I'm sick of my people. They're backslid. They don't know God. He was just pouring it out to me over the phone, and I knew exactly where it was coming from. I'm tired of preaching to him, and I have thousands of members. I'm tired of it, Steve. I want change. I want revival. I want to affect our city. And the man over the phone was doing exactly what I'm going to be preaching on tonight. He was seeking God. You could tell through his voice he was a God seeker. And we're seeing this all over the world right now. People are going after God, and nothing's going to stop them. They're going to plow their way through the muck and the mire until they find the truth, and the truth will set them free. They're after the Lord. Well, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. Those of you taking notes, you write these down in the chapel. All over the building, if you're not taking notes, whatever. If you're not taking notes, don't write them down. If you are taking notes, write them down. Is that good, Mike? Yeah, well, trying to help them out here. Should I take notes or should I not take notes? That's up to you, friend. I can't help you on that. I'm, I'll try to go slow, but if I go too fast, I go too fast. And I'll try to repeat myself, but sometimes I forget. I got a call the other day from a pastor because people love one, two, three-point messages, you know? And we try our very best, you know, but there's folks that come in, they go, they'll go, Wednesday, March 12th, March 12th, 1997, 907, The God Seekers, part two. 
Pensacola, Florida, Brownsville Assembly Evangelist Stephen, that's with a PH, not a V, Stephen Hill. And they're ready, man. And I got a call the other day because they're, they're, you know, I love you folks dearly. I really do. But I've been there, man, taking notes before. And uh, I believe I still take notes. I'm a journaler. I love taking notes. But, you know, you write the scriptures down. It's just cruising along. And, it, and it, point number one, you got it down, man. You got all the little subtopics. Point number two, all the little subtopics. And somebody sneezes during point number three or a baby cries. And you miss it. And then the preacher goes, and point number four, and you're sitting, you lose the whole service. Everything else is going on. And a pastor called me the other day. I mean, he was, friend, you thought his cow had been run over. His wife was in the hospital. I didn't know what was going on with the guy. He was just about to die over the phone. He goes, Brother Steve, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. I said, what is he? He goes, last Thursday night, what was point number three? <laughs> so I'm going to try to help you tonight, note taker. To seek means to strive after. Really, to seek means to seek. Okay, that's what it means. <laughs> but note takers would have a hissy if I did that. <laughs> seek, dash, seek. No. <laughs> to seek means to strive after. It means to covet earnestly. It's to search for. It means to zealously desire. It means to seek, friend. Go after. Hide and go seek. You hunt. You look for, friend. To seek the Lord means to seek his face. We all know 2 Chronicles 7, 14. You can write that one down. I'm going to give you a few scriptures. You don't have to look them all up. Just write down the address. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Say that with me. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. First Chronicles 16 11 says this, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. I love that. By the way, this is not a one-time thing. Coming to this revival, is a beginning for many of you, you're going to see an increase, an increase in the power of God flowing in your life. And one of the things he's going to watch you, friend, he's going to watch, the Lord's going to see how faithful you are with what he's given you. He's going to watch you. See, we've been here since Father's Day of 95, and we live exhausted. We live exhausted, friend. We're tired. We live tired. Revival will wear you out. Someone said, this refreshing is killing me. <laughs> it will. It'll wear you out. But you wake up the next day. <laughs> Who said, Spurgeon said, work yourself to death and pray yourself alive again. We'll work and work, friend. But we notice as we are faithful with what the Lord has given us, he increases it. And there's nights, friend, you can't stand in this building. The power just comes down. He sweeps through this place. People are saved. I mean, there's times, friend, where it's just like a glory cloud comes down, and the Lord's just watching us, seeing how we handle that. Hmm. A little bit more. I think I can give him a little bit more. Seek his face continually. Psalm 24, 6 says this. This is the generation of them that seek him. Richard Crisco in the chapel, I know that's one of your favorite verses. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face. Psalm 27, 8. When thou sayest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Are you getting the message, friend? Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. I love that illustration, Mike Brown, of pushing the buggy through the grocery store. You know, you got five minutes to fill it up. That's the stirring of the waters. You know, you've won this contest, and they said, Go through the grocery store and get anything you want. Well, the Lord right now is moving, friend. And if you'll study the history of revivals, there's been revivals where God moved for three or four years, and then it's almost like he lifted his hands to watch. He swept across the land. Now he's going, okay, now let me see what my people will do. And right now, he's coming down in power. He's filling us. Now is the time, friend. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Woo! Amos. 5, 6 
says this, seek the Lord and ye shall live. How many want to live? Seek the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, and you will seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. I was in my study early yesterday morning when the Lord placed upon my heart a sense of the intense spiritual hunger that is sweeping this land. Men and women, children and teens, grandmas and grandpas are being driven by an incredible craving for a genuine touch from God. I say genuine, underline that friend, genuine touch. People are sick and tired of the superficial. Every night of this revival, I see the faces of hundreds of people streaming towards these altars. As charity sings, run to the mercy seat, a host of people do exactly that. Oftentimes, you will witness the starving masses literally run to the altars. The other night, we had a large group from a high school. This assistant principal buses these secular kids in. They're unsaved. And he brings them here by the scores. And he brought them in here, and they came up to us before the service. The assistant principal said, I've got about 50 heathen with me tonight. Got and so, uh, but it, they bring them here and they're saved. That, 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 church, that school has gone from six Christians. It's 2,300 students in the school. In, in about five months, they've gone to six on-fire Christians up to almost 600 on fire. It's fabulous, friend. But I'll never forget that night because right before I was going to preach, we took, a, we took a break like we did tonight, and I was feeling in my spirit that some of the kids were getting antsy. You know, they didn't know the Lord. They were sitting there, you know, should I go to Burger King, Water, Whataburger, you know, Shoney's right now, what should I do? I don't know about this break. I've been in church an hour already. Is that enough, you know? And they didn't know what was going on. So I stood before the break, and I said this, some of you are so far away from God his spirit is trying to get a hold of you. He wants to change your life. And I spoke a few words into their hearts before the break. And then I walked over here like I always do just to greet people. We took the break. And these people started running up to me, crying their eyes out. I got to get saved now. I said, well, in just a minute, man. We're going to have an altar call. In just a No, I want to get saved now. I'm living in sin. And I go, okay, buddy, all right, just a second. I turned around, some lady standing there. i got to give my heart to Jesus now. I've got to give, friend, I've never seen anything like this in my life. What is it? It's called hunger. People are starving for the truth. They want a touch from God, and nothing's going to stop them. They smell the fresh bread from heaven and can just about taste the sparkling, clean, living water. All the demons of hell can't hold them back. Ooh. My goodness. The weeping and wailing at these altars, the repentance of sin, the crying out to God for forgiveness, the overwhelming desire that people have and that many of you have tonight to get right with God and live right with God is music in the Lord's ears. I want you to pay attention, friend. I want to talk to you about a group of people tonight. Some of you are not part of this group yet, but you're going to be a part. I learned a little saying uh, early in life, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You ever heard that? You can make them drink, friend. You can salt his oats. <laughs> and I mean, people coming to this revival, they ain't no more thirsty. They don't want nothing. They just come in and sit. Some of them come in to mock, make fun of us, to scorn us. And they'll sit there and they'll just be all satisfied in their sin. Before you know it, they're going, they're thirsty. And but you'll watch them, and at the beginning of the meeting, they were just sort of laughing and chuckling, you know, and just joking at everything. And now they're going, they're listening to every word, friend. Oh, I love it. I want to talk to you about a group of people, a spiritual race of people, if you will, that is beginning to rise up all over America and the world. This group of people are shaking the very foundation of our religious institutions. They are reading over the fundamental statements of faith of their specific denomination and calling out for a return to the faith of their fathers. You will find these people analyzing themselves and the religious world with probing questions such as this. If we believe that Jesus Christ shed his blood on Calvary to bring us back into relationship with God, then why do we depend so much on seven-step programs to give us peace, joy, and happiness? People are asking these questions. The other night I prayed with, a, with a, a jock basketball player, I guess he was in the back there, stood about 
six and a half feet tall, big man in uh, high school, college, I don't know what, but you could tell, man, he had it together, and he's just checking it out. Just watch it. Is at the end of the service, he's had his hands crossed like that, and I said, uh, how you doing? Fine. What do you think about all this? I ain't never seen anything like this in my life. What do you think's happening? I have no idea. And I asked, I asked him this question. I said, do you believe in God? I don't know. And I said, if there is a God, do you think he's powerful? Of course. Of course he is. See, this is what people are asking now, friend. They're going, you're seeing all hail the power of Jesus' name. Where's the power? See, young people are waking up. They're watching mom and dad sing that in the church, and then they walk out and mom's cussing dad or dad's cussing mom. Or dad's hooked on this or mom's hooked on this. They're going, where's the power? Where's the power? It's hypocritical, friend. And this guy stood there, and I said, do you believe that if God exists, that he's powerful? Yeah. Do you believe he can touch you? And then he got a little nervous because people were, people were flopping around on the floor all around him. And <laughs> There's some of you have a real hard time with manifestations. We don't major on them here, it's a minor thing. But uh, if, you have a trouble, if you have trouble with manifestations, you're gonna have a hard time with the Apostle Paul. The one who wrote most of this book, the New Testament, wrote most of the New Testament, had the most powerful manifestation I've ever heard of. Thrown down to the ground, noonday, blinded by a light, noonday spoke into the midair. Why? Because a voice in midair spoke to him. <laughs> if that wasn't enough, he was blinded. This is the work of the Holy Ghost. You know the perfect gentleman you talk about? You know how the Holy Ghost is just a perfect gentleman? Saul of Tarsus would question that philosophy. Because he didn't send a forerunner up there saying, Saul, take this. And he reads it and says, in two minutes you will be stunned by a light from heaven. Whoa. No, friend, he was hit down to the ground, blinded the third day. Somebody prayed for him, and something like scales fell from his eyes. Think about that, friend. And you got a problem with this? <laughs> you got to... Somebody's... Somebody's leg shakes. And you got a problem, friend. We could go on and on about this. That's why we don't park on manifestations. We don't spend any time with them here, friend. They happen, they happen. What we care about, you can shake all night long. You better be living right tomorrow. That's what matters. Paul could talk all day long about how the power came down. He was thrown to the ground, blinded, scales fell from his eyes. But the people were going, yeah, all right. Are you living holy? Yeah, he was. Is there power in your life? I come to you with a demonstration of power. It's a whole different story. Anyway, this guy was just standing there, and I said, if God is real, do you think he could touch you? He goes, well, yeah. This jock of a man, Charlie, you remember him, don't you, buddy? We've seen some stuff. Charlie walks around with me. We've seen some stuff, friend. I'm telling you, we see some stuff. That's the only word I have for it is just stuff, because... Things happen, man. People come in here, agnostics come in here, and they're thrown through the air by the power of God. I'm talking about God haters. God gets a hold of them instantly. You know, none of this three, four spiritual laws, you know, you know, Romans road to salvation type of thing. Wham! Ooh! Bam! Just, what must I do? I love it. I love it because I'm an evangelist. And I'll talk and talk and talk and talk to people about Jesus. But when the power comes down, friend, I tell you, change a Muslim just like that. You won't have to convince a Buddhist. Boom. That Buddhist is going, Jesus, Jesus. But this man, I touched him on the forehead. Wham! Down on the floor. Ooh. Right over here, the other, oh, I'll never forget this. A man comes up, stands right here. I'm talking about if Jesus is real, if there's power, where is it? Where's the power? Where's the power? People are asking these questions. Where's the power to deliver my daughter from all this pain? Where's the power to deliver my son? Where's the power to restore our marriage? 
This man came up forward right here, and, and uh, Charlie, were you with me that night? That was, Charlie, you're always with me, aren't you, buddy? I love you, brother. But uh, always have a witness, friend. <laughs> and uh, he comes up, and he, he, he cocks his legs like this, all right? And he's looking at me like, try it, Bubba. Like, <laughs> my name's not Bubba, and I'm not trying nothing. Either God's going to move or he's not. And I touched his forehead, and he, it was like lightning. Brandon went, wham, down on the ground. He goes. <laughs> you remember that? Huh? His wife was running? Oh, his wife was so scared she was ready to run, he said. I didn't see that part. But here's this, here's this powerful man, you know. He's, he ain't going to drop for nobody, but whoa. He dropped for the Holy Ghost. Then he gets back up. And I just touched him, wham, on the ground again. He goes, he's back up on his feet like this. He's a glutton for punishment, friend. <laughs> the third time. Some of you, I can feel the skeptics in this room. Some of you are going, dear God, what are you talking about? Friend, let me tell you. If God doesn't get a hold of this country, we're a bunch of snobs. We're stuck up. We're know-it-alls. Do you think God's going to get us again by just singing amazing grace? No, friend, we need to be hit by the power. You want fruit? Stick around for a while, friend. Thousands and thousands and thousands have been saved. You can hardly go anywhere in Pensacola without meeting people that have been dramatically transformed by the power of God in this revival. And a lot of it happened when the power came down in their lives. Anyway, the third time, touched him again. Wham! He's on the ground. And this time he's going, oh, 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 on the ground. And I said, what do you think's going on? He goes, I think he wants me to stay down here. <laughs> I think so. Three strikes, you're out, buddy. Whoo, that's not in my message here. But people are asking, if we believe that in the name of Jesus, a man can be delivered from drug addiction, alcoholism, and a host of other life-controlling problems, then why do we always lean on the secular world to solve these problems? If we believe that our country was founded by godly men on Christi, Christian principles, then why have we allowed our nation to slip into such a horrific, degrading, immoral decline? If we believe that our ancestors were Adam and Eve, not Cheetah the chimpanzee, then why are we allowing evolution to be taught as fact in our educational institutions? People are asking these questions. Did you know the latest Gallup poll that 93% of adult Americans believe in the creation, not in evolution? 93% of adult Americans, that's plus or minus 3%. That's a powerful Gallup poll. That means that a random phone survey, most of Americans are saying, we did not evolve, we were created. Yeah, it's powerful, friend. But this young people are rising up going, now wait a minute. If my mommy and my daddy believe that we are created, and my neighbors believe we're created, and my neighbors' neighbors believe we're created, what are they teaching this junk in school for? Where did the other 7% of an American adults get all that power? People are getting tired of it, friend. They're getting tired of it. If 80% of adult Americans believe they will stand before God, and this is a true statistic, 80% believe they will stand before God and be held accountable for their sins up there, then why? Don't we feel the weight of accountability down here? If 84% of adult Americans believe that Jesus Christ is God or the Son of God, that's another true statistic, 84% believe he is God or the Son of God, then how come we're allowing every other teaching to permeate and take control of our country? I'm telling you, friend, there's a group of people that's fed up. They are waking up. They are coming out of their spiritual slumber. They're slipping out of bed, reporting for their, for their repenting from their lukewarmness and laziness. They're putting on the whole armor of God. They're standing in line in attention, in anticipation of the commanding general's marching orders. 
This group of people is beginning to call in question everything that seems to exalt itself above Christ. Whether it be an obvious sinful habit like smoking, drinking, drugs, or pornography, or a recreation that consumes more time than it should like golf, fishing, sports, or hot rodding, or whether it be a religious part, piety without a personal relationship with God. Friends, those of you that are religious in this place but you don't know the Lord, you're as bad off as a junkie on the street. Worse off because you think you're okay. You're worse off. You're religious, but you don't know Jesus, friend. People are getting sick of all of this. Whew, they're dealing with sin and the devil. They're dragging them both into court. They're throwing the book at them and then following through with the death sentence. It's time, friend. The God seekers, I'm just going to give you a couple points and we're going to close. Matter of fact, everybody look at their watch. Get it over with. I mean, what does that mean anyhow? Some of you are going, let's see, I'm from Australia. Where would I be right now? <laughs> if I was back home in Sacramento, what would I be doing? What does it matter? Besides that, a watch here is just a decoration. It doesn't mean a thing. The God seekers, note takers, I want you to write these down and we're going to go through quickly, okay? The God seekers, number one, the God seeker, if you say you're a God seeker, that means you're going after God. You are willing to go after God, go after Jesus regardless of the cost. Regardless of the cost, listen up in the chapel, the choir room, the cafeteria, and those of you in the hallways. The God seeker is willing to go after Jesus regardless of the cost. You've heard me say, those of you that visit this revival, a man's desperation for the presence of God will melt all preoccupation with self, notoriety, public image, and social status. Young people, look at me. We've got a host of young people here tonight. If you're really after God, you could care less about what your friends think. You'll walk down the hallways of school with, with Turner Burn t-shirts on. You'll walk with a big old Bible. You don't care what people think. It doesn't matter what people think anymore. You're after God. That's all that matters. Your hunger and your thirst, if it's genuine, will drive you to eat and to drink regardless of the opinions of others. You will be willing to be a fool in the sight of your peers in order to be embraced in the arms of the Lord. That's what a God seeker will do, friend. A God seeker is willing to go after Jesus regardless of the cost. Peter said, behold, this is in Matthew 19, behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. Some of you cannot say that. But a God seeker can say that along with Peter. We've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. Friend, a God seeker will give up everything to follow Jesus. Popularity, young people. Fame. I remember a young man that came to me. And he said, I can't understand it. My dad, my dad just... He just keeps coming after me and coming after me. I said, what are you talking about? He said, my dad's offered me a, a six-figure salary. For some of you that don't understand, that's over $100,000. A new car, a house. I'm 18. If I will stay with the company business. Everything. He'll give me everything up front, he said, if I will stay with the company business. My dad's very successful, Steve. And he goes, but daddy doesn't understand. God's called me to preach the gospel. He said, I just want Jesus. That's all I want is Jesus. Now you can, you can make a six figure salary and have a nice car and have a nice house and be a God seeker. Don't misquote me here, friend, because that's your calling in life. We've had millionaires and it's my understanding, a billionaire that's come to this revival. People come in here from all over, and they both those people love God. We've had, we've had wealthy people that come in this place that didn't love God, and they got saved right down here at this altar. But you can, you can be filthy rich and be a God seeker, or you can be dirt poor and be a God seeker. The bottom line is you're willing to go after Jesus regardless of the cost. Peter said in Matthew 19, we have forsaken all and followed thee, Jesus said, and everyone that has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Friend, are you a God seeker? 
Are you willing to give up everything? Regardless of the cost, are you ready, willing to go after Jesus? Some of you aren't. You got too many strings attached. And you know this business, we say God's in a box. We've never had God in a box. You're the one in a box. You, don't, never, you never put God in a box. That's a joke. There ain't no box big enough or small enough for God. You have God in a box. No, you've been inside a box. God's been free all along. But some of you got them all closed in. You got it all closed in. This is, this is how far you can go, God, right here. This far and no further. This is what I'm going to let you do, God. This, he's long gone, friend. Are you listening? He doesn't, you ain't got a leash on him. He left a long time ago, friend. He doesn't mess with that kind of stuff. He wants freedom. Liberty. His son died. It was total atonement. He died to set you free, not for you to be in bondage like that. He died to set you free. Boy, God's speaking to some. Mm, let him do that. Number two, the God seeker will go after Jesus regardless of how painful the present circumstances. I don't understand that one, Brother Steve. Write it down first. The God seeker will go after Jesus regardless of how painful the present circumstances. No matter how hard things are, friend, a person that wants God will move forward. But I've got cancer, move forward. I'm going through a financial disaster right now with my business and my life. Go after God. That's when you go after God, friend. Go after God. A God seeker will go after God no matter how painful the circumstances. Look at the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. Here was a woman, friend, who was sick for 12 years, had spent all her money. She was wiped out, and the Bible said her sickness was worse than ever before. In her present circumstances, a God seeker will go after God no matter how painful it is. They will go after Jesus. And that woman got up out of her bed and she spread a trail of blood across that pavement, friend, all the way to Jesus. She found her miracle. She went after God in her condition. Are you a God seeker? Are you going to wait for everything to get better and then you might go after God? It don't work like that, friend. We always quote the thief on the cross, and everybody says, well, he got saved. Wasn't that wonderful? The thief on the cross was crucified. He was bleeding when he got saved. Have you ever thought about what he was feeling when he asked Jesus, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom? A God seeker will go after God. Something clicked in that thief's mind. The Bible says in Matthew that both the thieves were mocking, and then at Luke it says that one of them got saved. I'm going to tell you, he got saved, friend, probably by hearing Jesus say these words, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And when Jesus said those words, I can imagine that thief, his heart just sinking and going, dear God, what have I done? Turn to his friend across the, 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 on the other cross and say, this man's not worthy of death. We're worthy. We're supposed to die. We have committed crimes, but this man is, is not guilty said, Jesus, remember me. In the middle of his pain, a God seeker, friend, will go after God regardless of how painful the present circumstances. Some of you, the present circumstances is this. You're in sin right now. Are you listening? Richard, I hope they're listening in the chapel. Your present circumstances is sin, and it's painful. It might be an adulterous affair. And the most painful thing for you to do is to confess it. Or maybe it's a drug problem or pornography problem. And the most painful thing for you to do is to come to these altars tonight and get right with God. You're in the middle of the pain. Well, friend, that's what a God seeker does. That's when he gets healing. It's when he goes after God in the midst of his pain. Is anybody listening? I hope so, friend. A God seeker, number three, note taker. I'm moving quickly through these. I'm skipping some stuff for your sake. The God seeker is driven by a personal hunger ooh, that far excels every other desire in life. A God seeker is driven by a personal hunger that far excels every other desire in life. I used tonight an illustration by the, uh, the, the man named Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus when he was up in the sycamore tree? 
Remember how Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down, and Jesus went into his house? This is found in Luke 19. You can look it up later. But Zacchaeus wanted Jesus. Zacchaeus was a God seeker. I want to tell you, friends, some of you that are after God, you need to get up in a tree. Get out from the crowd, get up in a tree so Jesus can see you. Jesus saw Zacchaeus because he was elevated up in that tree. He made a move. Zacchaeus moved. Some of you, when I give this altar call, you want God to touch you, you're going to have to move just like Zacchaeus did. So Jesus can see you separated yourself from everybody else. You want God to move in your life. Zacchaeus is up in the tree. Jesus gave an altar call. Jesus did not say, Zacchaeus, hold tight. I'm on my way up. No, he said, Zacchaeus, front and center. Get down here. Today I'm going to be with you in your house. That's an altar call, friend. You want to do a study, pastors, look at the altar calls Jesus gave all through the world. He's constantly calling people out and over. I mean, look up the word follow me. That's an altar call right there. But Zacchaeus goes to his house and repents, and he said, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusations, I restore to it fourfold, to him fourfold. Those of you that are brand new Christians, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He had a lot of money. But I just got finished sharing with you that a God seeker is driven by a personal hunger that far excels every other desire in life. Zacchaeus' desire in life was to make money, but when he became a God seeker, money didn't matter anymore to him. What mattered to him was Jesus. What mattered to him was a touch from God. What mattered to him was forgiveness from the Lord. I'm moving quickly. I told you I would. The God seeker maintains an open heart. This is basically for Christians here. This one, this one uh, point. The God seeker maintains an open heart, always ready to embrace new revelations from the Lord. See, some of you saying you're a God seeker. I'm after God, pastor. Some of you saying, I want God. No, you don't. No, you don't. You already got it limited. You don't want God. You want to tell you, I, I was just like that, friend, several years ago. And the Lord showed me Acts chapter 18 and 19. You look it up later on. The last part of Acts 18, the first part of Acts 19, you'll see where Apollos, who was an eloquent teacher of the Word, a great teacher, a learned individual, had a following. People followed him. He taught, and they enjoyed it. But he was baptized under the baptism of John. And Achille and Priscilla, that's how you announce it. Is that correct, correct pronunciation? Achille and Priscilla, a couple other converts, came up to him. Now here was Apollos, a great teacher, had a following. Achille and Priscilla come to him, and they explain to him the depth. There's, there's, there's more, Apollos, than what you're teaching. The Bible doesn't say that Apollos rose up in anger and said, who do you think you are trying to teach me anything? Doesn't say that, friend. It's beautiful the way it all happened right there. They were all part of the same family, but some of you in this room, you're not open to a new revelation from the Lord. You're closed. Maybe you're here, you're a Lutheran or an Episcopalian or Pentecostal, but you've never had a, a mighty touch from God. And all this stuff that's going on is a little unusual to you. Friend, I want to tell you, you better open up to new revelation from God. Those of you that are Methodist, John, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, the whole gang of them that roamed around together, Philip Doddridge, Fletcher, all those guys that hung out, man, every one of them would come in this place and say, we've seen that before. We've seen that before. They'd walk around here with their robes on going, mm-hmm. I remember that back in the 1700s. People shaking under the power of God. People falling. We've had people hit by the power of God. Sinners in this place. When the power came down, they fell under conviction. They fell out of their seats and were like dead men. They've been carried from the balcony. I'm talking about sinners and just dumped at the altar. Wesley saw that all the time. Whitfield, we've seen that here, friend. A God seeker is one who maintains an open heart, always ready to embrace new revelations from the Lord. Another example is in Acts 19. You'll see where Paul is in Ephesus, and he comes to a group, I believe there's 12 men. He comes to them, and 
They know the baptism of John, and he talks to them about the, more, the, 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 the deeper things of God and talks to them about Jesus, the baptism of Jesus. I'm like, is, is that right? And then he's my theologian. I run everything by Mike. If you have a problem with my message, just call Mike. <laughs> I'm serious about that. Awesome man of God right here. Seriously, if you have any problem with what's, what's going on, and I, I say this in seriousness, this man is so learned in the Word. I respect God's gifts to the church. Mike is an on-fire Messianic Jew who is fluent in Hebrew. As a matter of fact, his favorite translation is not any of the translations that's in this church right now. His favorite translation is the original, which he carries with him everywhere he goes and reads from it. Powerful. He's spoken 50 times for Ty at Times Square Church for David Wilkerson. He's moved here with his family. He's going to be doing a teaching session on Friday. And whatever you got planned, if you're planning on going to the mall, let me tell you something about malls. A mall is a mall is a mall. Right? They're just different shapes, but it's all the same. I don't care how they got the shoes arranged, it's all the same shoes. Mike's session is a whole lot better. But are you ready to embrace new revelation? These folks, friend, in Acts 19, received what Paul was saying to them. And they received what he was saying. Not only that, they were filled with the Holy Ghost right there, the Bible says. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And God spoke to me about those two, two portions of scriptures one day about three years ago. He said, Steve, you're not open. You're not open. You've learned it all, haven't you, Bubba? You've learned it all, son. You've been in the great Argentine revival. You've seen some of the greatest things in the world, haven't you, Steve? You've been, you've been raised under some, of, under some of the greatest, most anointed evangelists this world has ever known. You've got it all together, don't you, Steve? The Lord spoke to me. He says, no, you don't, son. Let me tell you, you've missed it. You've closed yourself into the things of God. You have not opened yourself up. A God seeker is open to new revelation from God. Did you know, pastor, that God may want to reveal to you some vision about your city? He may in a dream one morning at 4 o'clock wake you up and you're stunned as you look around the room and you see black spots and white spots and black spots and white spots and the Lord starts speaking to you about demon activity that took place in your city 200 years ago. Neighborhoods that were in, under covens of witches and things. And the Lord shows you this in a dream and you wake up and you go, honey, boy, I just had the weirdest dream. Hey, make me a cup of coffee. And you just brush it off. Why? You're not open to things of God. You're not open to anything new from God. Some young kid comes up to you and says, Pastor, 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 I've had a vision from God. You go, yeah, what is it? What is it? Little seven-year-old kid wants to tell you about a miracle, about a vision she had. You go, yeah, yeah, what is it? <laughs> Listen to this, Sally. Listen to what this baby girl's trying to tell us. Maybe little baby girl's got a word from God. How open are you, friend? A God seeker is open. A God seeker has a tender heart, always open to a new fresh touch from God, friend. You better stay that way. I'm going to close in just a minute, but I'm not finished. I'm skipping some of these. I had 87 of them, but I'm going to cut it short. <laughs> just write this one down and we're going to move right off of it. The God seeker is willing to deal with sin when it is, is exposed. The God seeker is willing to deal with sin when it is exposed. I'm going to say that again. The God seeker is willing to deal with sin when it is, it is exposed. Peter, you remember in Luke 22, don't turn there, friend, I'm just going to quote it to you. The Bible says, now this was after Peter had already denied the Lord three times. Jesus turned to him and basically that look from Jesus exposed him. That was exposure. He exposed him. Jesus knew Peter knew. Jesus knew that Peter had cursed and said he didn't even know the Lord. What does the Bible say Peter did? He wept bitterly. You know what Peter did? He repented, friends. He repented, and a God seeker, that's why I've always loved Peter, he stuck his foot in his mouth all the time, but he was always after Jesus. He was at the transfiguration, were you? He was always hanging around Jesus. He walked on water, have you? Peter 
was always a God seeker. If that's you, Jesus, let me get out of this boat and walk out there to you. He was a God seeker, and a God seeker is willing to deal with sin when it is exposed. Are you, friend? A God seeker is willing to pay the price when persecution comes. Mm. We could park on that, wimp. Telling you what, friend, if there's one thing I'm so tired of in America, it's, it's spineless Christians. Did you know in this revival, all during the week we have teams of teenagers, they don't even come into these meetings. Where do they go? They hit the streets. We pray for them in the back room. They go out evangelizing all over the city. They hit the beaches late at night talking to people about God. They go door to door through the neighborhoods. Why? Friend, they're not into frills. They love this revival. They love singing, but they're soul winners. And they can handle when someone looks in their face and cusses them out. They can handle that. Matter of fact, one girl came to me after school one day and she said, she goes, I'm so happy. I said, what happened? I got cussed out today at school. And they're thrilled that they can suffer a little bit for his namesake. But some of you, somebody cusses at you or looks at you funny. You hide your Bible. They talk to you negative. Maybe a group of them will get together in the classroom and point at you and say, there's Susan. What a joke. Susan's a Christian. Susan's a Christian. And you just, you clam up. You turn red. What a spineless human being you are, friend. Stand up. Open your eyes. Lift up your head. He's the glory and the lifter of your head. Lift it up high. Walk over to him. Walk over to him and let him know, I love the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart, soul, and strength. He has called us to live a holy life. He has called us to live a separated life. He said, come out from among them. He's called me to live a godly life. He said to get rid of sin, and I've gotten rid of sin. He said for me to preach the word, and I'm preaching the word. Look at him in the face, friend. Don't clam up. A God seeker is willing to pay the price when persecution comes. Look in John chapter 9 later on tonight, and you'll see about the blind man that was healed, how he was persecuted, his own family. He stood with his family, and his family said, he's of age, ask him. They sort of denied him. Then the religious leaders just persecuted, just crammed everything down his throat, and he said, hey, listen, just hush your face. All I know is I once was blind, but now I see. You don't want to become converts too, do you? You don't want to be a Christian too, do you? Keep meddling with me, you're gonna. But a God seeker is willing to pay the price when persecution comes. Well, it's early, but I'm gonna close. The God seeker will go after Jesus regardless of the opinions of others. Woo. Write that down, friend. Now, a lot of these are intertwined. They almost pick, pick up where the other one left off. The God seeker will go after Jesus regardless of the opinions of others. Are you friend? Do you care? We've already talked about you. You'll go after Jesus regardless of the, of the cost. And you're thinking, yeah, money, fame, riches. Opinions of others. Opinions of others. Wonder what they're going to think about me. Pastor, what's going to happen when the power comes down in your church? What's going to happen when the power comes down in Japan and Norway? What's going to happen in Australia when the power comes down and, and some of the laid-back, stayed, lukewarm Australians look at you and laugh at you from across town? You're the G. Hallelujah. <laughs> what's going to happen, friend, when, when they speak wrongly of you? As I speak right now, I promise you somewhere around the nation, somebody's talking on the radio against me. They're always talking, they, they hate us. I've never met the people, but they hate us anyhow. But they're opinionated. Someone's got their opinion against you, and pastor revival breaks out in your church, and the next morning you wake up and, and in the paper, there's a little, in the editorial section, there's a little letters to the editor, and there's a write-up about your church, somebody blasting your church. And you're sitting there drinking a cup of Folgers, reading that, and you cringe inside. What are you going to do? Turn to your wife and say, honey, we've got to stop this revival. Look at the way they're talking about us. They're talking to us about holy rollers, and we're talking about hanging from the chandeliers and all this kind of stuff that our forefathers used to do. And, and uh, now they're making fun of us across town now, and, and honey, we need to stop this revival. Friend, 
Who cares about the opinions of others? Did you know that blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, if he had listened to the opinion of others, he was a God seeker. Boy, was he a God seeker. He was a God seeker. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's between you and Jesus, by the way. Always has been, always will be. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's a God seeker, and everyone else is saying, shut up, Barnabas. Their opinion. He doesn't have time for you, son. He's in doing bigger and greater things. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. He screamed more the louder, friend. Then finally, what happened? Jesus stopped. See, Bartimaeus, his story would not be in the book of Mark if he had listened to everyone's opinion. You know, everybody else's story's not in the book of Mark. Have you noticed that? <laughs> it's not in there. Have you ever noticed you just don't read about the critics that much? You know, once history's written, all you read about are the miracles. Think about it. Look up Methodism and the, the beginnings of Wesley's ministry and all. All you read now is a powerful books about what happened and how it all took place. But there was thousands of people against him. Where are they at today? They're bygones, friend. It's over with them. Wesley lives on. Why? He tapped into the right source, friend. And he didn't listen to the opinions of others. And don't, if you're a God seeker, it won't matter what anybody else thinks. A man called me from Dallas the other day. He said, Steve, they're talking about you here in Dallas, man. He said, it's on the radio. They're talking about you. He's talking bad about you. He said, doesn't, doesn't that bother you? And I'll be honest, friend, you, no one likes to be talked bad about. You just don't like it. But I told him, I said, honestly, brother, I don't miss one night's sleep. I can lay my head on the pillow at night and... Man, I'm, I'm out cold. I'm exhausted, friend. <laughs> and I, I take the same stand that Abe Lincoln took. They asked Abe Lincoln, what do you do with the critics? How do you handle all the criticism? He said, I don't deal with the criticism. He said, I'm too busy running a country. And friend, we don't, the criticism, we do the best to answer some of it when, it when it deems answering. Mike Brown is answering. He's got a book out coming out called Confronting the Critics of Revival. Get that book. It's going to be out when? Two months? Two and a half months. Confronting the Critics of, the, of Revival. Pastors, look this way. It's going to be the manual. It's going to be the manual on revivals and critics. It is going to be the book. Scriptures, everything, friend. It's all there. It's going to be a manual that you can take and give to anybody and say, just read that. With a open heart, read this. But friend, most people that talk bad, we don't have time. We don't have time. Why? Too busy in the work of the Lord. Kerry Robinson made a statement a long time ago that I love dearly. He said, this is Kerry Robinson right here. He said, let the dogs bark, the caravan's moving on. I want everyone to stand. Everyone stand. Now, don't misquote me. I didn't call all these critics dogs. I did not say that. I said, Carrie said that. <laughs> everyone with the chairs, I want you to move them to the left and the right as quietly as you can, and then line up against the side. Are you a God seeker tonight? I want everyone to pay attention. Those of you moving the chairs, I want you to pay attention. Do not talk among yourselves. In the chapel, choir room, cafeteria, I want you to listen up. Right now is the time for you to get right with God. A few minutes ago when I talked about a backslidden condition, many of you could have come forward right then and there. You know you're away from God. If you've come here for a refreshing from the Lord and there's sin in your life, do not come forward at the second altar call without coming forward at the first. The first one is to get rid of sin in your life. Don't ask us to lay hands on you if there's a major sin in your life. I'm, talk I'm not talking about if you had an argument with your wife this week. I'm talking about, friend, if there's sin in your life. 
I'm talking about continual sin. There's something there that you haven't shaken, but you want an anointing too. That reminds me of Simon the sorcerer who tried to buy the Holy Ghost. It doesn't work like that. God does not anoint unholy vessels. You may be saying tonight, well, I don't know, Brother Steve, we've heard about fallen evangelists and great evangelists of years gone by that were mightily used. That's because the Word was preached. The truth was preached. They could have been living in sin, friend. They were preaching the Word. God will use His Word. A drunk man could give an altar call and preach the Word, give an altar call, and people get saved. But that drunk man would go to hell. But I'm talking about a mighty anointing that many of you folks are after. He's going to anoint a clean vessel. Those of you that are religious in this room, I'm going to talk to you in just a second. But everyone listen for the next couple minutes. Charity's going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. Before she sings, I want, to un I want you to understand what why you've got to come forward in this place. Everyone on this campus that has sin in their life, you have got to repent. Repent means to turn around. It means to ask Jesus to forgive you well before the Lord, weep before God, turn it over to God, ask Him to cleanse your heart. That's the foundation that's got to be laid in America. You've got to do that tonight, friend. That's the first thing you've got to do. For those of you that are in sin, and you know exactly who I'm talking about, there's sin in your life. Some of the things I named a few minutes ago, those of you that are in pornography, that's an abomination to God and you know it. If you can look at a naked woman, sir, and not turn your head in a split second, as soon as you see that, you turn your head. That's a hellish sin you're involved in, friend. You need to repent. A man came to me the other night and he said, Steve, I can't shake this lust. And I said, sir, look at me. How old are you? He said, 42. And I said, you're a grown man. He said, yes, I am. I said, are you married? He goes, yes, I am. I said, you have no business lusting. You're a married man. You got children? Yes, I do but I just can't shake it. And I said, it sounds like you don't want to shake it because a man can do what he wants to do, friend. You can do what you want to do. Don't tell me that you're so easily led. The Bible says there's no sin taking you, but such as is common to man. But God will give you a way of escape. He will give you a way of escape, friend. And a lot of times it's this right here, turning your head. That's why he gave you a neck. Just turn your head. But some of you don't want it, but tonight you got to repent. That's what you got to do tonight, is repent. Ask Jesus Christ to forgive you, to wash your sins away. Those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, I shared with you at the beginning that Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago for you. He shed his blood on Calvary. He was the sacrificial lamb. John the Baptist pointed to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Everything, friend, was laid upon the shoulders of Jesus. Everything, everything you've ever done was laid upon him. He paid the price for you. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. You know, I preach in maximum security penitentiaries. And it's amazing when you get back there with all those lockups that are facing life anyway. You know, some of them are going to go, they're going to die in the penitentiary. And I start talking about the blood and the cross and the sacrifice. You watch grown men, hardened criminals, Wiping their eyes like that, man. You watch it. Why? No one's ever died for them, man. And when you start talking about the blood and the pain and the whippings and the beatings, all for you, man, because he could have stopped it and said, Father, Gabriel, Michael, slay them all. But he didn't. And those guys will sit out there and they'll go, Dear God, he did that for me. He did it for you, man. Now, what are you doing for him? And I watch convicts begin to stand in front of all their friends, tears in their eyes, giving their lives to Jesus. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of convicts saved like that. Hardened criminals. I'm talking hardened. When they hear about the blood and the sacrifice. He did that for you, friend. For those of you that are saying, I want God to do more for me, he doesn't have to do anything more for you, friend. It's time for you to start moving towards him. He moved towards you 2,000 years ago. He died for you. Now it's time for you to make an effort to move towards him. Young people, don't ever ask God to make it easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus. It shouldn't be easy for you. You should live day in and day out a sacrificial life just like he did. 
asking Jesus every day, Lord, today, strip any sin from me. Cleanse me today, Lord. Help me to live 100% for you today, Jesus. Just like you live for my soul, I want to live for you, Jesus. For tonight, those of you that have never known the Lord, you can meet Jesus Christ down here. You've come in with a burden of sin on you. He came to take away that sin. That's what it is, friend. It's not your marriage. It's not your money. It's not your car, your boat. It's sin, friend. Sin is what separates you from God. That's why you're unhappy. You can come and pray to this pulpit and nothing will happen. You can sit in a circle down here and hold hands with a bunch of friends and chant all night long. Nothing's going to happen. But if you'll come down here and hit this carpet and ask him to wash your sins away and cleanse you, he'll do it. For those of you that are religious here, you know all about him, but you don't know him. You can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. You can go to hell with a baptismal certificate hanging on your wall. You can go to hell, friend, with a confirmation certificate from your local denomination in your file cabinet. You can go to hell and be one of the founding members of First Baptist Church, Mobile, Alabama. You can go to hell. You can go to hell and be the superintendent of the Assemblies of God. You can go to hell, friend, if you don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus. Religion is hanging around him. We're in the most religious season of the year between Christmas and Easter. This is when everybody gets religious. You've already seen the Easter decorations coming up all over, and pretty soon it's going to be hopping bunny time and chocolate bunny rabbits and, and little eggs and Easter egg hunts and, oh yeah, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And people are going to go to cantatas all over America and watch that scene. Oh, millions are going to watch cantatas and millions are going to walk out unsaved because they've done another religious thing. And I believe in cantatas, pastors. I believe in them. But people come in, they watch them. If you give it a cantata, Pastor, give an altar call that they'll never forget. I mean, friend, nail them. Nail them. At least they'll walk out of there going, I know what he meant. I know what he meant. I know what this cantata was about. But you're here tonight and you're religious. You know all about him, but you don't know him, friend. You can go to hell. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go to hell with a clerical collar on. You can go to hell with a certificate of ordination from your denomination hanging behind your chair. You can go to hell, friend. Do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Is he everything to you, friend? Are you the bride of Christ? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? I'm going to say something that's going to disturb you, and we're going to, she's going to sing this song. I've had people get so mad at me for saying this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. I said, do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? The Bible says we're the bride of Christ, and we're, so, we're supposed to be anticipating his return. Just like any earthly bride would constantly be thinking about his groom, her groom, so the bride of Christ should be constantly thinking about Jesus. A bride, even if she's at Gaffer's looking at some shoes and the groom is 15 miles away, she'll be looking at those blue shoes, or those yellow shoes, or those mauve shoes, or whatever color they might be, and she would go, I wonder, if, I wonder what Billy would think about these. She's thinking about the groom. I wonder if he'd like this jacket. I wonder if he'd like this, this outfit. Why? Always on her mind. Always on her mind. I wonder if he would like this meal. I like this. I wonder if he would like this. Why? She's consumed. You're supposed to be that way with Jesus. And if you're not, everyone look this way. If you're not like that, you need to question your salvation. And I question it. Paul said to the Corinthian church, examine yourself. Look inside and see if you really are who you say you are. Some of you call yourself a Christian. You need to change your name, friend, to heathen. Because Christian is a little Christ. That means Christ lives in you. And would Christ, who lives in you, be doing some of the things you're doing? Either change your name or live up to it. I'm going to give this altar call right now. Those of you that know you're supposed to come, you're going to come as soon as she begins to sing. Others of you that know you're supposed to come, you're not going to come because of pride. 
That's what's holding you back, P-R-I-D-E. It's a damnable characteristic from hell, friend. It's what that caused Lucifer to fall from the heavens. He wanted to ascend to the most holy place. He wanted to be like God. Pride cast him out of heaven, and pride's going to cast you into hell, friend. Pride is keeping you in your seat. You're saying, I don't need to go down there. I can pray when I get home. Friend, God's speaking to you. He's trying to get your attention. I just spoke to you about God seekers. A God seeker could care less about anyone else's opinion, but here you go again. I wonder what Judy's going to think. I wonder what my boyfriend's going to think. I wonder what my pastor's going to think. I wonder what my parishioner's going to think. I wonder what God thinks. That's the question, friend. What does God think? If God's speaking to you about coming down here and getting right with him, that's what you need to do. You need to get right with him. And if you think you're going to go home and talk to him in the secret of your little closet, let me tell you, friend, you're in for a rude awakening because you're going to get back to your hotel or back to your home and you're going to hear the Lord say to you, at that meeting a few minutes ago, I used my servant to speak to you. And he gave you the opportunity to go down to that altar and you wouldn't do it because of pride. But now you're in your bedroom all alone with me. Now you want me to forgive your sins. My son was crucified on the cross for you 2,000 years ago. He shed his blood. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was scorned. He was ridiculed. He was cursed. He was ripped to shreds for you. He was stripped and naked and hung on the cross for you, nailed in the feet, nailed in the hands for you, and stuck on top of Mount Calvary for you, for everyone to see, not behind Mount Calvary, but on top of Mount Calvary, for everyone to see. He did that all for you, and you couldn't walk 25 feet for him. You couldn't walk down from the balcony. You couldn't come forward in the chapel. You couldn't step forward in the cafeteria or the choir room for him. And he did all that for you. Think about it, friend. It's pitiful. The Bible says if you're ashamed of him, he's ashamed of you. If you'll confess him, he'll confess you. Right now, Charity's going to sing, run to the mercy seat. If you need mercy, if you need forgiveness, if there is sin in your life and you want the Lord to wash it away, if you've never known the Lord or you've known him and you've backslidden, I'm going to open up the altars right now. I want you to come and hurry, hurry, come down here. Hurry, come on, come on, come on, hurry. Right now, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Sing it, Charity. Hurry. Hurry! Hurry! Everything is unknown. Hurry, come on! I face the power. I need the Lord. 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 I did not know of a place I could go. Come on. Where I can find a way to heal my own soul. Come on! statistic in the United States of America. Don't be like that. Be a God seeker. Be someone who goes after Jesus with all their heart, their soul, and their strength. Get on your knees right now in your living room, in your den, and weep and wail for your own sins. Go after God. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to cleanse you. Ask him to make you new. Be a God seeker. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. What does God think? What does God think? Go after him. Come on.
God's getting a hold of folks here tonight, friend. Those of you at the altar, don't anyone move. Stay at the altar. Stay right at the altar. Everyone at the altar, stay right here. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, friends. The Lord spoke to me about closing this altar call right now. He spoke to me about closing it. This is a serious night. Those of you that are thinking about waiting till tomorrow, tomorrow is a word only found in a fool's calendar, friend. Don't ever bank on it. There's people that were planning on going fishing tomorrow that were buried today. There's people that are planning on going to Disney World this summer that were buried last week. They thought they had tomorrow. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to step out and come forward, then we're going to close this altar call. I'm going to close it in 60 seconds. You better make up your mind, friend. If you know you're supposed to be down here, God bless you. Come on, right now. Starting right now. Let's go. Hurry. 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 50 seconds. 50 seconds. For we have place. to stay with you. I want the singers to come up. I want you to sing that through a couple times, Lyndall. While everyone at this altar, I want y'all to begin talking to Jesus. Some of you have already talked to him, but I want you to continue talking. Pour out your sins to him. Don't anyone leave at this altar. Come on. Y'all sing it out right now. This is mercy. He will forgive you. everyone at this altar it's my understanding we had almost 300 come forward in the chapel cafeteria the choir room I know has come forward every one of you here I want you to bow your heads everyone at this altar by the way for the critics that are visiting us tonight we never count these numbers if we counted these numbers you'd see numbers like 250 300,000 on the billboards out front we never count all the numbers of the people that come forward the numbers you hear are half less than half but God's at work. People are getting right with God in this revival, friend. From backsliders to people that have never known the Lord, people are getting right with God. And one of the things I've learned is I've spoken to so many thousands of backsliders. Some of the backsliders are worse off than first-time converts. They've been deep into sin for so long, they've grown so calloused and so hard. But thank God he's speaking to them in this revival. Everyone at the altar, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Everyone in the chapel, choir room, cafeteria, in this main auditorium, pray with me out loud right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me tonight. 
Tonight, Jesus, I am a God seeker. I am seeking your face, not your hand. I don't want another handout. I want the face of God. I want a relationship with you. And I want to begin that relationship by getting right with you. I ask you tonight, Jesus, to forgive me. I have sinned. I have hurt you. I've hurt others. And I've hurt myself. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me clean. Wash my sins away. Cleanse me, Lord. I ask you tonight to be my Lord, my Savior, my very best friend. I commit myself to you 100% from this moment on. I am yours and you are mine. I will seek you all the days of my life. In your precious name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.